quite relaxed in the morning. It was a nice sunny day, but the boys had started to get a little bit um, restless and I sort of suggested to them, you know, maybe going out for a little while might be a good idea. So um, they, they wanted to go and they had got five dollars Jared had and Malcolm had money but Jared's intention was to buy a comic. That morning I was fitting the, the two seats to the rear of the disco. Um, I, was, I remember I was upside down trying to fit bolts in. I, I just seen the two pair of legs on the driveway as they made their way to the shop. They just went right past me. Never said anything. five children and Jared's the second born. He was a very happy baby. We lived in Bunt Island when the first three were born and just um, in a small flat um, and then moved to Australia when Malcolm was five, Jared was four and Beth was two. We've been a really close family uh, always really, but during the, the travels, because we didn't know anyone, we would all, always be together and it was a really nice time. But initially we were treating it as a, a working holiday, but uh, we soon realised that it was a good life and we enjoyed it there. The opportunity came up for us to be transferred up to a new factory in Newman. So we went up there and were there for three and a half years. We actually felt very at home in Newman. It really was similar to Bunt Island where Stuart and I had grown up. We knew people, um, we felt part of the community. People were really kind to us. That year I had dried in my class. He was just an awesome, awesome boy. Very artistic, very polite, very mature. Uh, he would yeah, come out with some pretty funny things every now and again. His art was incredible for his age and um, he enjoyed, really enjoyed doing that. I knew Jared through living in Newman. Um, I grew up with him there. Um, obviously Newman being a tight-knit community that it was, um, everyone knew everybody else. When you'd see him around, he was always smiling. Yeah, just a beautiful person. Cyrus's mum and Rosina came over for a holiday and we decided to go down, pick them up. We went down to Perth for uh, a two week holiday. I owned the property uh, that the Ross family stayed at. It was rented out via the Tourist Bureau. And in those days, I would go down and welcome the families that came to stay. So I remember going down on the weekend and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ross arrived with three children. And that surprised me because it was school holidays. It wasn't school holidays. I remember the little boys playing um, out the front of this place. And they, I think they had skateboards or something like that. They just seemed just happy little kids. On the Sunday afternoon, we got ready to go to meet my sister and my mum at the, the airport. My sister was bringing the two car seats for us to turn our, 
are, bring, are land over into a seven seater for the twins being born. And then we went, there was a market close by, and we went to that and they sold comics. Jared got a couple of mad comics because it was second hand. And um, we just walked along from Kent Street to there, and I think we walked into the bigger shops. Kent Street is one of the oldest streets of Rockingham, so Rockingham's development was along the foreshore uh, at uh, Rockingham Beach historically, and so Kent Street was an older street. It, uh, it's a leafy street, it's uh, quite an attractive street, uh, but it's older houses, older part of town. It was a holiday feeling we had and quite relaxed, and it was just exciting that my sister and my mum were coming over, we were really happy. They're all, they, you know, they've grown up with their aunties and, um, and their grands, so they were really happy. So yeah, it was, we were definitely in holiday mode. I remember them arriving and uh, my auntie taking us down to the beach uh, just for a bit of an ice cream and things like that. Uh, and then so the next day, Jared and I were mucking around like brothers normally do and we had seen a, a comic book uh, store uh, the, the day before at the shopping mall, so decided to go along there. About 9.30 uh, of the morning of 14th of October, Jared left the house on foot. Um, shortly thereafter, Malcolm left the house on his rollerblades. I remember getting on the rollerblades and sitting on the, the door at the apartment and then Jared had uh, walked past, past me and when I had got the rollerblades on and started going, um, I just passed him not that far in front of the apartment. Malcolm overtook Jared around 99 Kent Street and uh, indicated to his brother, I'll see you at the shop. That was the last sighting of Jared. Malcolm travelled um, on his rollerblade, so he went to, it would have been southwest on Kent Street, down towards the, uh, the comic shop. When he got near the uh, gold service station, he turned right, uh, went into a small park that was there where he took his rollerblades off and then switched them for his shoes. I got down to the, the park where we had said that we would meet up and was, uh, was there for uh, a while and kind of thinking, oh, he's taking his time. I was just thought, oh, he might have just gone to the shops. So, uh, I went to the shops and had a look, but he wasn't there. So Malcolm came home an hour later, just said he couldn't find Jared. Um, I think he thought Jared had come home. At first, obviously, you kind of don't suspect anything that bad, but I just thought he's going to be in trouble. Not at that point. I thought he was in the shop. I thought they'd, they'd missed each other. So I think the first thing we did was Stuart and, and Malcolm and myself went back to the, the shop, um, expecting to find them in the comic shop. And that's when I started to, to panic. I went in starting asking in the shops if he'd been there. Stuart started back working on the, the cars and I started walking along the street myself. So I walked along Kent Street um, and then I went down to, there was other shops. I remember coming back and saying to Stuart, this is, you know, I'm really worried. After that, I think I made the decision to go to the police. But I went into the station, um, I think that would be about one-ish. They told us to go and look in the, the Bicker shopping mall. Um, so we went and did that. Um, again, I think at first they maybe thought I was, you know, overreacting. Yeah, I just, I just remember being quite frantic. They said that if he hasn't turned up by six o'clock to go back and inform them. It was such an unbelievable feeling something like that uh, happened and you didn't think anything like that would ever happen. The, the horrible feeling of just driving around looking for your son. In the afternoon or the, the evening when he still wasn't found then um, I just kind of remember sitting on the bed with my mom just crying. 
in the late afternoon, I, I was getting very concerned. Uh, and like Sarah, so I was just thinking the worst that because this is so out of his nature to do something like this, that that something had happened and that, that stopped him coming home. It was about three o'clock, three or four o'clock, and I just was, I knew. I knew that something had happened to him. I remember I was out in the garden with my mum and a noise came from my sick. I was wailing. And from then I knew I knew something bad had happened. <laughs> <laughs> 